Thank you all for coming. Um, so um, let me see. I have a couple things to say first. Um, thank you to uh, the San Francisco Public Library for the use of this wonderful venue. Uh, it's, a, it's been a great partnership and a lot of fun. And um, uh, the lectures are sponsored by Adobe, which enables us to um, record them on video. And they generally appear on the web uh, about two weeks after the, after the lecture. Um, so you can go, you can see, oops, you can see all the past ones, and this one will be available in a couple of weeks. Um, this is actually part of the Type West program at Letterform Archive, which is a year-long postgraduate certificate in type design, and the students are, I think, pretty much all right here. Um, uh, and uh, they had a wonderful two-day workshop with John last weekend. Um, on, on uh, brush written Roman capitals, which uh, it's challenging, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, he's good, isn't he? Yeah. Um, and uh, there's another workshop uh, coming up this, this coming week, uh, weekend, a public workshop, uh, which I think is full, so. But anyway, um, do uh, keep an eye out for our upcoming uh, workshops. Uh, I think this is the next one. Um, Stephen Coles and Christopher Sly from Adobe are um, uh, doing a, a workshop on type selection, which is really fun. And then also we have coming up at the end of January, Nadine Shaheen, who's one of the premier Arabic type designers in the world and works at Monotype in London. Um, so she's doing, um, this is the lecture, which is uh, here at the library on January 29th, and then the following weekend there's a workshop um, at Letterform Archive. Um, some of you may know, because we talked about it exhaustively during the Kickstarter, that we're publishing a book about the woodtype prints of Jack Stauffaker. Um, it was successfully funded, the Kickstarter closed on, uh, on Friday at I think around $77,000. The goal was 65, so we're very grateful it is being published and um, we're hard at work on it now, um, and it's gonna be a beautiful book. Um, you can still pre-order it. Um, if, you, if you go to our website, there's a link to Indiegogo, and um, you'll hear more about it when it actually comes out. Uh, and then, of course, anything else you need to know, just go to the website. There's lots of good stuff about um, lectures, events, workshops, um, publications, etc. cetera. Um, so John Stevens, um, is, is just an extraordinary uh, artist. Um, he started out uh, as a sign painter in New York, and that skill comes that you guys know what that kind of brush skill is about, and it goes back uh, a long way with him. Um, and he's worked for um, a lot of well-known brands, uh, Lucasfilm and Tiffany and, and uh, Time Life and so forth. Um, he's in a lot of collections of calligraphy, including, as, as Suzanne mentioned, the Harrison Collection here. Um, and, but mostly, oh, and also he has a book called Scribe, um, the, Art, uh, the Art of John Stevens, is that right? Scribe, the Art of John Stevens? Artist of the Written Word. Artist of the Written Word, uh, which has been in print for the last, I don't know, six, eight, ten years, and it's a, it's a wonderful book. Um, and I just want to say that um, my, my first love was calligraphy. I started in the 70s. I encountered John's work, I think, in the late 70s or early 80s, and it, it just stunned me. Um, there's no one living who does better brush Roman capitals, um, and um, which is not to denigrate. There's a stone cutter in the audience tonight, <laughs> and he, he brush writes on stone. Um, so I don't, I mean, uh, his, his work is wonderful too, but uh, John just has a special touch um, with the brush and um, makes extraordinarily beautiful letter forms. But also his calligraphy with pen and brush is, is exquisite and um, very creative and very modern and innovative. Um, and it meant a lot to me. I didn't actually meet him until the first time he did a workshop at the archive about four or five years ago. but. Um, I think we're kindred spirits, and I'm a big fan. So please welcome John Stevens. Uh, 
I did have this workshop this past weekend, and it was kind of a revelation. Youth and enthusiasm <laughs> and talent, uh, and talent really came across. And um, whenever I teach brush Roman, or just Roman, you know, it's a deep end of the pool type of thing. And, you know, you present your information, but you don't want to push people off the cliff right from the day, day one. And th there is no easy way around Roman capitals. I mean, I hate to say it, but it's just the way it is. Now, we're kind of in a revival, would you agree with that, uh, of calligraphy and letter arts? So, um, and a lot of it is social media now, and some people here are doing it, a lot of people are doing it. And the revival, it's really good that we can disseminate information quickly and easily, but there's a little bit of a downside. And I named this lecture Beyond Exemplars. What did I call it? Beyond Dectus, Ductus and Exemplars. So it's not like I'm doing a rant or declaring a war. I'm going to need my glasses to see my notes here. Don't get old. Um, so that's my first advice. <laughs> um, anyway. So there are many talented calligraphers and artists in the world. What I'm known for is probably a, wide, a pretty wide range. So this demonstrates that, you know, to me, these two things are related. And I hope by the end of this lecture, you'll see it through my eyes a little bit. So, and Rob is correct. I started off as a sign painter. So why is there an airplane? I feel when I pull away, my voice drops way down. No? Good. Thanks. So, um, that's my dad, and he's, that, he built that plane. And it flies, and, <laughs> and it's not a model. And, um, you know, poor me, when I went to school, uh, when I told the teacher and everybody else that my father built airplanes, they assumed I was talking about model airplanes. Then when I told them no, he gets in them and flies, um, well, I got made fun of. But anyway, he goes out to the airport, every chance he's got, and he meets another pilot who has a very similar plane. This is called the Pitt Special, and it is kind of special. It's the one that was at all the aerobatic um, shows, like in Oshkosh, until this other plane came along and kind of kicked its ass. But, um, but it was very cool, and he built about six planes, but he met my first teacher in letter forms, which his name was Tony Perner. Now, He's not well known in the lettering world. The lettering world doesn't look anything like it did when I started. So, um, but, um, so I started as a sign painter. And um, for a long time, I kind of ran away from that moniker and, uh, because I felt it wasn't taken seriously. And in the 80s, the computer came along, and it was just a mess. But just to give you a, a this would be my run-of-the-mill type of work I was doing. And I'm showing you this because I think when you say sign painter, people expect to see, you know, ham, dollar, 39 a pound, big dollars, big numbers. And, um, but this is just a few years into my, um, I already got through the apprenticeship, and I, I'll admit it, I was a pretty quick study. Um, so that's, that's all gold, gilding, outlined, and all that stuff, and that's like a Model A Ford. And I'm working inside of a, a shop that um, restores these cars. There's a story, but I'm going to move on. Um, and shortly after that, I got this lettering job. This might be Carl Roars' photo. Um, the, just very interested in Roman capitals and classic letters, even as a sign painter. So these are gold leaf, and those are not maybe five-eighths of an inch tall. And it's a lot of brush control, and um, so I'm already studying. Uh, but I haven't declared myself a calligrapher yet. I'm about 26 years old here. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you. I should read my own notes. The Morgan Library in New York City. Um, so, and I only got this because it was a recommendation from John Benson. And that is another down the rabbit hole story. I forgot I can use this thing too. Um, and then um, I can do this. Okay. So, I'm just going to go through a few slides of some 
semi-recent work. Just to get, introduce myself, I'm not going to assume everybody knows me. So, um, so this would be, this is pre-digital anything. This is a piece of paper, blue piece of paper, and this is a layered piece of, uh, you know, fairly complex piece of calligraphy. And um, I didn't show the whole thing because it just tends to, I don't know, feels very far away, and I wanted to get it close up. Um, but it's, a, it's an artwork for a cover of a book, and it's a one-to-one -one thing, which is pretty risky for a lettering artist to do. If you, know, if you don't know what I mean by that, it means a lot of book jacket designers would do things bigger and reduce them and with the idea that they got sharper. But there's a risk in that also, um, and so I didn't want to take that risk. But I've done quite a few book jackets over the years. I like designing titles, and a lot of them are children's books. Um, some of my favorite work was designing titling. Um, a logo, you know, a lo lot of that kind of thing. Uh, the design game and um, taking some experimental ideas and putting it together with my lettering knowledge. Um, you know, that was really kind of the peak thing for me. I really loved that. So wine labels, um, I've done many of them. I did this one for a Napa design firm who in turn was doing it for that brand of um, wine. We had to pull it because they didn't get clear the name. Um, but um, Gatto Design, I, if anybody knows them, but they're, I think they're in the nearby valley or something. Anyway, uh, so illumination, this is the traditional calligrapher's craft. And again, just to underline, I'm showing you a range of things that I work on. Um, so uh, this is part of a book. Um, uh, it's the Carnegie Hero Fund Commission. I'm writing out the names, the heroes, and their act. They receive a, a medal and recognition. Um, this recent, well, a year ago, uh, quotes about a free press, the fourth estate. I prepared uh, many versions of these quotes, things that I thought would work, and we somehow ended up with this. Uh, and so there are several of these. Imagine to be creative to embrace possibility, to push boundaries, all of these kinds of things. These spreads uh, to, with a quote like that. Um, I love doing it. I didn't quite understand the reference I was making here, uh, letter style wise, but um, you know, I'm never gonna argue with the client on that. Um, so another phase of work is a ti doing titles as illustration. Um, this is a book about the Royal Mail you know, in the United Kingdom, Royal Mail Special Stamps Yearbook. And, you know, I got direction about we're going to focus on those stamps, I guess about Captain Cook, and um, I'm sort of free to design that how I want to. And um, then in some cases I draw it out in a vector program, Illustrator. Um, other times uh, it's, um, oh, a couple of years ago I did this cover that Carl asked me to do, Carl Roars, um, and it was in this uh, Neuland dish kind of style where everything's packed as tight. And then that led to this commission, and this is a poster, uh, the um, quote of Martin Luther King, and the firm was Design as Play, um, and they're in town here. Um, the, uh, the thing here is, I thought I was going to do that digitally. That's, that's an original on Arches paper, and that's you know, that, that, that was a request that they have it as an original. So I have made forays into typeface from time to time. This is a, a prior, proprietary typeface for another wine concern. And it's loosely based on uh, hand letter titles that I had been doing previously um, for the same brand. And I have, this is a menu for a chef Alex hit, Hits, and this is a function to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the signing of the Treaty of Versailles, and it was at Palace Versailles in France, not Las Vegas. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, and, and, and the, the request was, I follow a tradition which was this kind of like off the edge corner illustration. So, 
you know, every once in a while I have to call on those skills. And then there's this, um, I'm just going to read what I wrote here, wall writing for an exhibition called Letter Forming at Wake Forest University, New York, uh, North Carolina. What the hell am I thinking? Um, okay, this was crazy because, you know, you see a wall lettering and you see a lot of you would think you would outline it and fill it in, but no, this was with a brush that was about this wide and a lot of these types of body movements. Now, here's what you would never think of. I have to get up on a ladder and get right to the ceiling, and then I also have to get down on the floor to do the bottom. Now, maybe I would have been comfortable with that in my 20s, but let me tell you, that was, and to, to have some kind of calligraphic integrity because they wanted the strokes. The show was called Letter Forming, and it was a celebration of type and letter forms, um, which included, didn't have traditional calligraphy, it only had that kind of thing. And by the way, that's a Jasper Johns uh, to the right of me there. You, you know, he's pretty good. <laughs> okay, so here's like a more traditional, you know, lettering on a wall in a church. And I have a note here, North Carolina has a few of them. Um, so, and this past summer I pulled out the old gold kit, the old sign kit, and it, uh, there's a friend of mine who has a music shop in the building where my studio is. And, you know, they say it's like riding a bike. And in 30 years, the materials had changed. I probably should have called Carl on that one, too. But uh, um, the materials were different, but the process was basically the same. And, um, and it's gold, so, you know, what could go wrong, right? And then, you know, I did run a special on yacht lettering, um, and this one, <laughs> this is an 80-foot yacht. And so um, I, I want to reiterate that, so it's letters, you know, calligraphers talk about craft a lot, but I'm interested in this image as well. So I'm creating an image here, so, or you could say a logo. But letters as image or illustration interest me quite a bit, and I don't know that people know that. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the visual principles, sort of like a tour of what I think matters, uh, if you will. This is a nameplate for um, a restored harpsichord. See, I hang with pretty good company, right? Yachts, harpsichords. Um, and uh, so it's 17th, 18th century. I'm writing on wood. It's not a drawing. It's not a painting where I'm sitting there with a little pointed pen or brush. It's supposed to be writing. That's the way they were done. And um, so anyway, um, so that's kind of a rough intro to the types of things I've been doing. Um, what I want to do is segue over to some thoughts about design, specifically visual language, which I do make part of my classes. Um, I talked only a little bit in this past class about it, but you know, I'm not the kind of teacher that walks around the room and says, oh, you didn't make that E, it need, the stroke needs to come out. What I want to do is teach people to learn how to make those assessments visually. Now, um, clearly these, this is in like an innocuous E, nothing to it, um, yet just shortening that middle stroke changes the character so much, right? Right? No? OK. Um, <laughs> So, <laughs> you know, it's leading the witness. Um, so if I just do that, raise it and lower it, it just says a lot. Well, this, this motivates me in, in my work because I feel a lot of this lettering and letter design, every choice that you make has an impact on everything else. Now, again, the people who are on Instagram know that you can do some finished, beautiful piece of work, maybe a typeface, and maybe somebody will respond to it, maybe they won't. But I know if I stick an exemplar up there, I know that's going to get a lot of hits, a lot of likes. So what's the deal? I mean, it's not that I don't like exemplars. Um, the thing is, they get treated like a destination. So my take is the exemplar is a signpost, not the destination. But they're treated as that. People think they, they get them and just do what's on that page. They're doing calligraphy. And really, there's so much else that goes on. And again, I'm not trying to put anything down. I'm saying, well, 
if, if my job is to stand here and kind of tell you how I see it or how I do things in my world, then this is it. Uh, um, so this is a, an example of maybe a study that I would encourage uh, where I have the fifth century, um, this is the one I'm supposed to point with, um, fifth century Unchil, which I happen to like, and I have my thoughts and notes down here um, talking about the shapes of the O's. What I'm trying to do is learn how the hand works, not just what stroke comes first, what stroke comes second. There is a code here to be deciphered. The way the rhythms, I think the rhythms are particularly beautiful. I think when you're talking about did the pen lift off the corner on the serif, I think you're on the wrong question. So then I make myself a little exemplar. Oh, this thing kind of died, right? Yep, I need a cat up here. Um, and then off to the right, in the top, I have two variations. The beyond the, I don't know how to say that word, but uh, you know, that's not required. That's a variation I did for a book jacket, and there's one up in the right-hand corner that is more kind of, has more of a monoline feel. Um, and so that really interests me greatly, the idea that um, you know, I'm, I'm segueing into the history of how history can be our teacher and our source of inspiration. I call them guiding ideas and themes. Let a form modification, well, that can be taught. That is a, a series of, you could say, steps. You could be methodical about that. The history is um, as Johnson, Johnston laid out, which was the idea that the history of lettering is kind of like a de-evolution from the archetypal capitals to you know, um, slowly breaking down until we get to minuscules. Uh, we go through a lot of stuff in the middle, you know. Um, and yeah, there's also this thing of, a, 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 what I call a continuum or bandwidth of archetypal to handwriting. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. There's cultural influence. I talk about brush sensibilities and contour um, and form, rhythm, and movement. So these are thematic ideas that uh, I try to explore in classes. Um, and what, I, what I'm doing is, not that you go around remembering this stuff. It's the idea of once your attention is drawn, you can't unring that bell. That's, that's the thought behind that. So classical letterforms, that's a big thing to me. I did this in 1985. And it was for the book 316 that Donald Knuth gathered a bunch of um, calligraphic artists to do this. And I was assigned that the words listened, rebelled, almost everybody, that had to be emphasized. Now in a class, when I say emphasis, a lot of people, that as they're learning, think that means put it in italics, make it bolder, put an underline, quotation marks, parentheses, in red. In other words, it doesn't need as much on it to have emphasis. Um, so I, I feel like this has stood the te test pretty good of time, so I was happy with that. So it's just simple contrast. That, that's, that's where the interest is. That's where the emphasis is. I talked about letter form modification. That can be as simple as you look at the three A's, and the main thing is the relationship from thin stroke to thick stroke. The first being monoline, the second one kind of transitional, and the third one uh, more extreme. And then also the third one, an introduction of a serif of some kind. Um, again, I'm shooting for eventually in a class that people understand these relationships, that how you, when you shift one thing, everything else shifts with it. But I feel the exemplar way of teaching teaches you just to go from letter to letter to letter, and it's each is an isolated instance. And then just to the right of that, there's compression and then a kind of modularization. That is a word, right? Um, and so all the curves are, are modified off the circular to make them match and be harmonious. Um, so classical element of handwriting formalized. So here's, italic is more allied with handwriting. And uh, 
And we always see demos of it being written like this. But to me, this letter form is image thing is this is very, this is sculpted letters almost with a pen. They're written, but they're written slowly and carefully. The arches are, are carefully matched. Um, you know, every letter is, has its space. It's not impinging on the neighbor. In other words, it's not accidental writing. It's, it's, but it's not quite letter, drawn lettering. It's not that either. So on this spectrum of formal to informal, um, it's leaning more towards the formal. Um, the, so here's some more of that more formal italic being applied and then a bolder, um, you know, a little bit of contrast. Then uh, here's something that just as much effort goes into this and it's got more based on handwriting. Um, it's got branching, it's got altered shapes, compression, it's mostly in the branching that we get the sense that there's handwriting. Now, I'm not doing too much with moving the letters around the grid. I'm staying pretty close to that. But this quote says something about the writing. And I think one of the myths that in calligraphy is that writing has to look as fast as it was written uh, or it's not calligraphy. And I, I don't buy into that. Um, so arrangement, centered or staggered. And here again, compression and roundish kind of italic. There's quite a bit of skill in making pages like that. These are not just images. Um, calligraphy does require a lot of practice. Um, nobody's going to deny that. When I'm teaching a hand like italic, I like to put three categories together. So the top one being closer to the traditional, might even have a little bit of 17th or 18th century influence. The middle one is more upright and has a easier to understand but powerful rhythm, almost like black letter. And the bottom one is kind of based on loosely on handwriting. But again, I'm separating the action of the hand from visually what's going on and how to stay aware of this stuff. So in the last class that I taught, on this last May, this formula worked pretty well where people could kind of, you know, when you're in the mall and you need a you are here sign, this is a pretty good one. So here they are again. Um, the left image is, the, uh, is a, for a postage stamp uh, for the Royal Mail. And you know, a lot of thought goes into the placement and design of these pages. The right one is a page that's in the Harrison collection. Now. So we get something like this, and I think what I'm trying to say is italic is not one thing. Um, so, you know, Warren Chapel used that phrase, living letters, and I kind of like that. Um, is this italic? Is this gothic? We spend more time in trying to name things than teaching our eyes to, or feeding our eyes to see. So this has the branching. It is compressed, but it happens to be upright. Um, so this history, as Johnson, Johnston exemplified, um, is more detailed than this, but I don't know if it's understood or recognized that Johnston really started this school of thought, this idea that, you know, this basically, this family tree. And on the right is the very same idea. Hildegard Corger did that. Um, that somebody you ought to look into. She's not as well known, but great calligrapher, great teacher um, from Germany. Um, okay, so from the history of writing, I referred to cultural influence. So these are quite literal. Uh, and it's where I just would say we pick up ideas from other writing cultures, right? But they don't have to be literal. These were experimental pages of calligraphy that I did where I wasn't thinking that. It's only after the fact that people would say, that feels Asian and that feels Islamic, right? Um, the truth is, from a formal language standpoint, this one on the right, I was playing with the white spaces between the letter forms and working the horizontal as the main carrier of the weight of the letter. It just, I think, we make those associations and, and they stick, you know, people. Taking it a step further, um, not just parroting some kind of script 
that you picked up somewhere, like, hey, I got this style down, you know? It's mo more like a dance, complex rhythms, you make a stroke with a brush, and intuitively, where does the next stroke go? And I think I saw something today on social media that was like, your life is pretty much making a piece of art, then trying to do one better, and then another one, and then the end, you know? Um, so, not a bad life, right? That's, so this thing, I feel like I play the classical side of calligraphy is the kind of craft. I showed you some projects that I was working on. And the other half is the closest analogy is um, improvisation like a jazz musician. They're very knowledgeable and schooled about music. They have a good understanding of music theory. But it's all in service of freedom of being able to have confidence in your intuitive decisions. And to be even more specific, it's being able to stay in character, meaning once I start a graphic idea, I can stay in that graphic idea. It doesn't fall apart. Now, I've had plenty of pages that have fallen apart. Mm -hmm. And I suppose if I was you know, an honest broker, I'd have those up there too, but we don't have time for that. <laughs> uh, anyway, so now, I'm kind of moving along to that brush sensibilities and contour. It seems a bit of a surprise to people when I say there are no straight lines in Roman letters. You know, it's, a, it's, it's kind of the wonderful yin-yang of it. It's, it's um, a Roman letter is a, uh, based on a geometry, as many of you know, um, but it's fleshed out sort of like the human body is fleshed out on a frame, you know, if you look at the contours from one side of your arm or any other, you know, appendage, um, you'll see that there's these all these moving lines that converge and divide and go back. And Roman letters have a lot of that um, feeling to it, and I think that's where the life comes from. So broken into ductus, the strokes are not that easy to do. That's I'll be honest, <laughs> but more importantly, they must align. That's really what people spend, after they learn the stroke, they have to align. So can you see the complex contour of the crossbar of the T? It's not just a straight stroke with two endings on it. And that's sort of stuff that excites calligraphers, you know, is to try to go for that. Here's it broken out a little bit further in this alleged book that I'm doing. Um, uh, and that's what I do. I go into explanation as to, so what matters to make the finer points of this alphabet? This is not a beginner how-to manual, because um, it's just too many things. But um, it is continuing Johnston's thought. We owe a debt to, um, Johnston thought that the tool is somewhat responsible for the shape of the letters. And we owe a debt to Kadich, who continued that thought and introduced the dynamics of the brush as a, as a causal tool, not just, oh, you can make letters with a brush. They were making letters with a brush in England. They just didn't have this methodology that it was responsible for that very peculiar shape of the serifs that are not, well, everybody who was in the class this weekend knows exactly what I'm talking about. So, or you could do this. Uh, an example of overthinking the issue. So th the brilliance of the Romans is that the forms do have a geometric base, but this is what they added. They added those brush sensibilities, they added the serif, and they added shaded writing. Shaded writing is thicks and thins. There's somebody, a paleographer would argue they see some evidence of that in Greek, uh, but it's not a methodical repeatable thing that you see, but you do see that in most Roman inscriptions. And we have lots of proof that the brush was involved in this. Um, so I won't belabor the point. But the whole Renaissance was filled with this. And, and I love those letters. I mean, I'm not against those things. But, you know, and I'm not even proposing one is better than the other. In the end, it's all about the image. So this triad is a really important thing to me. It's a form, rhythm, and movement, right? And I guess upon hearing that, it sounds like, duh. Um, but it's really, I think it's pretty eloquent. The 
form can be identified as capital, minuscule, or cursive structure, what I got going across the top. But I can also talk about that quality of form, and that's what I was just saying in brush sensibilities, how refined, how detailed it goes into the serifs, how the joins are. So that all deals with form. And, you know, Roman is like the matrix for everything that follows, so um, structure with sen sensuality, which I talked about. And before I met or read um, about Kadich, I was still trying to make Roman letters, but I was building them up with a brush. And some of them look pretty good. I showed you that um, early piece from Morgan Library. Uh, but I started to recognize there was an inherent order underneath what I was doing that I wasn't fully understanding. Why the weights were where they were. Why is the serif this big? That kind of thing. Uh, so letter design, it led me down the road to letter design. Um, so the, the brush has the cause of the shape, and this is what we owe to Cadditch. So formal to informal, and also uh, where we're bringing in more movement as we start down the line here. Um, I'm going to come back to movement. Visually speaking, rhythm is the glue that holds stuff together. So the, the reason, again, why the, the exemplar is problematic, because you're not really putting letters in context. You're just making a letter, following the strokes. And yes, I agree, a beginner has to do that. But understanding the rhythms of how this works is something that should be on the radar early on. Um, so here is like a piece with subtle rhythms going on. Um, and yet they're pretty straightforward looking letters. I call this rhythm in mass, combined with slight movement. Um, when I'm working on a piece, I don't go and all these words don't come into my brain. What I'm thinking about is, but I do play with this like clay, back and forth, you know, how much, a little more of this, a little less of that. Uh, it would be like color theory. So movement, you know, uh, you take this top script, and there is a little bit of movement in that. The bottom one, a lot more. Which one do you think was more complicated to do? You know, with, with calligraphy, we're always talking about performance, like how did you do that, what kind of tool, what kind of pen. In fact, calligraphers are always identifying work by tool. Somebody would say, oh, that's brush, as if the brush could do it itself without anybody holding on. Um, so I feel that's fairly inarticulate. It's not inaccurate, but I just don't think it gets to the heart of the matter. It's a lot of work to get to um, the kind of movement that's in that namaste. And that thing to the right, that well, that's just me playing a game with letters, you know. Uh, again, that it holds together as a unit. I developed this further into a, a method um, called the script model, in which we build from static letters as you know them and into more dynamic. But the thing of this as a tool, and this is in my book, so I didn't just cook this up this morning, um, is that we can get, do step one, step two, step three, gain confidence with this little bit of movement. We don't feel like we're being thrown out into the deep waters and then progress from there in this methodical way. So what would that look like? Uh, variation, form, rhythm, and movement, I, that piece apparently is back there, beginning to alter the f forms of the alphabet a little bit to make room for that extra um, movement and keeping it glued together with rhythm. Now, that all seems like a lot to think about. But you don't, if I was describing mixing colors, that would sound about complicated as that, but when you're actually working with it, it doesn't, it doesn't feel like that. It's just, again, it's consciousness. Um, so, a little bit more on that. Um, I call this rhythm and movement advanced because in these texts, I have the, um, I pulled these out of bigger pieces and the, the rhythm is moving, is forward, counter movement backwards, and on the one on the left, we're coming off the grid. And so you can think of the letters as either floating or um, you know rising, I don't know. But um, the, the idea of coming off the grid and having this much movement, it can get out of hand quickly. And I think so one might stay away from that. Um, but following some steps where you filled up the comfort to do that, 
So I'm like that musician who, like on a piece like that, that is a real sort of play piece for me. I mean, I know how to do straight Roman letters, so these are the kinds of visual games I play with my, uh, with my work. And here's a little, uh, another example of a lot of form, rhythm, and movement. I don't, the forms don't suffer just because I'm moving the pen. And, or sometimes they do get changed. All right. So, I put visual literacy high on the list at an early age. These were two early books that I read. Um, and they, they were both, in a way, life-changing because one, you know, reducing, you know, the principles of two-dimensional design. I mean, you've all taken classes and, and sure, and I don't know if you know this book, but I thought this one was pretty straightforward and really did a good job. And the other one, the real eye-opener, was this primer of visual literacy. How many people feel comfortable in that world of visual literacy? Anybody? Yeah? Okay. So it's hard to explain if you don't, if you're not familiar with that, but that the lines, shapes, movements, and space all have meaning even before you connect it to content. And being literate in that really helps reinforce your design work and your choices. And there were, there were many other books I was reading at the time. Uh, this one by Susan Langer, she was like an art philosopher. And a, a simple, this is like haiku to me, a line divides a space, it is also a path. And, you know, that takes us into, um, well, I, I'm called it part two here, visual syntax and perception. Now, here I'm mindful that I'm in pretty deep for a lecture, right? I mean, uh, um, and, you know, I got to kind of dig my way out here. But, so the universal line and two lines interacting, design principles and content. So I'm just going to move forward. Um, and what I feel the line is in understood in every culture. And I think that's good news, right? And you have Paul Clay. Um, so he didn't, he wrote the, that's his little pedagogical sketchbook in the lower left-hand corner. And I don't have my pointer back, okay. Um, but a line is a dot that went for a walk. So I just wrote that out quickly because I, I like that. But it illustrates a point. So there's a lot of attitude, there's a lot of emotion in very simple line. In the form, rhythm, and movement model, the forms get broken down a little bit in favor of rhythm and movement. Can you follow that? Is that that's, that seems pretty simple, right? Okay, and not, not that you're simple, but I might I think I'm complicating it. <laughs> um, so um, this idea of two lines interacting, um, I kind of stumbled that into teaching. I, uh, I would be talking about the things I'm talking to you right now. And I realized that if calligraphers could just think in terms of line and shape and, you know, take the letters out of it, because the letters have a lot of performance anxiety attached to it, right? So if we could take that out of it, we would be, we could swing freely, right? So um, the other element up here besides the line is what I call the interval. Now, these are, a lot of these are musical references, um, uh, interval, the space between the notes, but that they matter. So um, I started teaching a class called Two Lines Interacting without an exemplar, right? So how do you learn this? I kind of misdirected people with this sculpture idea. You had to make 30 sketches of, uh, we're, we're going to put a sculpture out on the lawn. I want it to be calligraphic, and you got an hour to do 30 of them. And of course, it's always, ah, how am I supposed to do that? And it goes very quickly, right? But after a while, people, you start, you go through these phases of repeating yourself. You go, I, I want, you're going to do something overly complicated. You're going to really try for more. But eventually, you kind of get to the guts of this. And you, you realize that you have a lot of ideas that you don't even tap into. You start speaking the abstract language, and it's only two lines. So it's not a mark-making class. It has a directive, and um, it's got a lot in common with uh, improvisation in music. Um, 
So it's a different problem than conventional letters with a pen. Um, and it, I think it's an, a determining factor. And it, it, the awareness or sophistication of this is, exists at different levels in, in different students. Uh, it's not my job to point that out. It's my job I feel when I'm teaching. And by the way, this, this class has always been pr successful in terms of people not feeling like beat up and mm -hmm. defeated because they can find something about themselves they didn't know. Um, and they get to see, with, I, we line the walls with these things and it's pretty wonderful. So, and you know, some of the inspiration, the, the, I publish a book for the class and it explains it and it breaks it all down, but you can see some of the inspiration up in the middle top, you know, um, got Miro, we got David Smith, we got Robert Motherwell, we got Alexander Cal Calder and Clay up there. The idea, they're just working with lines in space. And this has tremendous value to a calligrapher to just even get their hands wet with this, to get, to, to come on to a first name basis with this stuff. And they, a lot of them don't get there until they take a class like that. Um, so, convention versus invention. I'm sorry, I gotta pull a Marco Rubio here. Um, It's hard to talk this much. Um, okay, so convention is the, you know, we look in the past and we practice what we see and we try to catch up with what everybody else has already been doing kind of a thing. And invention is more like what I was just talking about. Now, where does that show up in letter forms? Um, two pieces of what could loosely be called italic, but I hope that the relationship is pretty apparent between these two, just even if that it wasn't before, just based on what I've said, you know, um, the three categories of italic are identified. Um, actually, what did I write there? I'm just uh, writing based. Okay, I'm feeling like I'm dragging on here. Um, contrast and flow. Um, it's very deliberate, nothing is accidental. And I think that is something I'm having to say because I really do believe most people think calligraphy is a lot of accident. You know, it just came off the pen, I just saw his hand do it, uh, it's directly written, it's very quick. And yet, when I'm actually working in my studio, it feels very much the opposite of that. It feels like, I want an image on the page, and how do I do it? What, what should that look like? What weight should I be working in? Um, what, what letters could I be emphasizing? I, I don't even say letters. I think of lines, shapes, forms, space. Um, and that's really what I want to put across uh, when I'm teaching. Um, not styles, not a collection of styles, but thinking about it, how to do it. Um, so making a good letter, but letters that interact in some way. Um, I was just talking about interaction. The other thing is calligraphy takes a ton of practice. To do that level, I'll be honest with you, it takes a ton of practice. I've been doing it all these years. It still takes a ton of practice. I wonder why it's not getting easier. <laughs> Anybody have any idea? <laughs> um, I, I don't know. Um, so Johnston didn't believe in over practice. So I, even in this most recent class, I kind of stopped him in the middle and said, "Let's we got to make something." We got, and I, I don't mean something like I don't know. I'm very specific about what that thing has to be. And it feels like I'm pulling the carpet, or and I start feeling like Mr. Miyagi, and this is the Karate Kid, right? So, the making something is a way to push our brain in a different direction. Practice will become numbing after a while. It's it as soon as it starts feeling safe it also starts feeling a little mindless. Now, it's a paradox. You do need the practice to get better, but a lot of times we lose the plot, what we're practicing. Doing something put, brings that question back into perspective. What is it I'm really supposed to be practicing? What really matters uh, in my work right here? Um, so, an over-practice will kill the invention thing. So, what would an exemplar for this look like? Um, Again, it is a total improvisation, flow, and arrangement. It holds together because of an awareness of the relationships and the character of line. And I know 
that it's not an accident because it's consistent. I did, I did it on purpose. But, of course, I'm free-flowing uh, with a pen. Th these ter this terminology gets confusing. I, I realize that. So, again, spontaneous inventions, and I think my um, contribution here, if, if you will, is that, you know, how do I stay in character once I start something like this? Besides exemplars, calligraphers nowadays are really good studiers of other people's work. They, they see something and, and then they go around and identifying, oh, that's like so-and-so, or that's like so-and-so. Sometimes it's true, but sometimes it's just that, like a little kid who just learned what bottle is, oh, that's a bottle too, you know, it's like uh, we start seeing um, everything exactly the same when in fact it's not. This piece on the left is very connected to an earlier piece where I said I was really focused on the horizontal stroke, but now I'm giving it a different shape. Um, and one of these is brush and one of these is pen, um, but it doesn't really matter, does it? Um, so just a lot of form, rhythm, and movement. So if, I, if I'm teaching a class, you know, and if it's going to be a creative class, it's going to be how to read these forms so I can repeat them. So, and to me, doing that is where we're going to get closer to the, what an idea of writing considered as an art might be. So back to this Wake Forest image. Um, I needed the visual literacy part in order to pull that off. It wasn't a technical problem. I mean, it was a physical problem because I had to be, you know, it was a big brush and I wasn't used to handling it. But knowing where I was when I'm making that stroke and being able to repeat what I had sketched out on my piece of paper or come close to it or have the same spirit of it, um, that was the real trick to that. He wanted a piece of writing. It wasn't supposed to be a painting. Okay, design principles. I'm not sure about that one. <laughs> um, so. Okay, so I'm going to start editing here. Learning about solving design problems will take you um, pretty far. And when I bring that out in a class, I have some assignments where we are designing, but not in the way non-designers think. Some people hear that word design, and they think I got to get ultra creative. Then I say something like, I see somebody, they take their lettering, and they start putting it on a diagonal. I said, oh, by the way, no diagonals. I go, it takes too much designer to handle that. <laughs> You know, I said, you'll, you'll never get it resolved in this workshop. It's too t difficult. Um, it's because I don't have the time to get into all the visual implications of that. And if they could just make, in the, in the last class I taught here, we're just making a folio. And we're just trying to get these two things to work together, a text and an image. And believe it or not, that's a tall order uh, in, a, in a calligraphy workshop. Um, so I ended this with, the, well, this part, because this is only one of 25. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> it doesn't matter what the tools are. The design problems are still there. I don't feel enough emphasis is placed on design uh, in, in the let calligraphy world. Um, the, this, this term here, unity within variety and variety within unity, um, I think that comes from uh, Armin Hoffman. Um, uh, a, a Swiss designer, and he's written books on design and graphic design, and it's a nice yin-yang thing, but how I apply it to my work is if I have something that, you know, let's say I'm conventional letter forms, it's already unified. Um, I just have to find where I'm going to bring some interest to it. And then the reverse, some of those more frenzied, chaotic things I just showed you, how to uh, take all that variety and unify it. And so it's, it's, it is the yin-yang of what we have to work with in design. And um, wow, I'm scared of this one. Uh, <laughs> see, you're, you're trying to put this thing together, and you start getting lost in your own deal. Uh, so th this is a highly experimental uh, thing. And, um, and you know, so I have this idea, this image in my mind when I'm making this stuff up, that I've built my vocabulary. I, like, I still like this jazz musician analogy. They're always pushing. 
They're going to go into odd places and then try to dig themselves out, and this kind of builds that creative muscle. So I created this, again, once going to a workshop, because I wanted people to um, get out of the convention. So I would say, pick one from a top on this wheel and pick one from a bottom on this wheel. And what does that mean? And some of it is um, going to create thoughts that don't seem compatible or resolvable. Like we all know if we put something bold and something light together, it'll go together. You know, um, Armin Hoffman used the definition of, I wrote it down here, let's see. Um, Jesus, John, cut down this stuff. Um, well, anyway, it goes something like, um, design is resolving an encounter before, between two dissimilar elements. And, you know, so a lot of people play with design, but they don't actually r resolve things. And it's in our DNA to find resolution to stuff, right? What this puts you in a, in a position, if you, we play with this as what I call design prompts, it makes you uncomfortable because you can't resolve some of it. Some of it's easy. If I said, you know, cursive, condensed, that's pretty easy, right? But let's pick another one. What does um, historic gestural look like? You know, what does, you know, monoline cursive look like? Or uh, that one I can think of pretty easily. But some of these forced people into some very uncomfortable places and they got angry. Um, so where does it come from? Um, I would get these design assignments and it would go something like, well, we want this to look like an ancient lettering, but modern. <laughs> this is true, this is true. I can even tell you the job. Um, and so you go into your studio and First, you go through a period of, what do they mean? I mean, do they, do they even know what they're talking about? And then it's you treat it as a wish list. Check, check. Um, but what it really comes down to is it's not the, you, you're hardwired to resolve something, but it's all the byproduct of you not resolving it that's interesting. So I go into my studio the day after, after feeling defeated that I didn't get it done, come in the next day and all of a sudden, lots of interesting things. Some of the things that I've shown you that well, I thought were interesting. Um, but it took me in new directions and it's working in that discomfort. And I also know this from being a musician. You throw somebody into a, a, a Lydian mode versus uh, the, the, the normal do, re, mi mode and that, now they have to think on their feet. And again, it's not always gonna work and you are gonna make mistakes but it's gonna take you into a different place. These are simple design prompts, and you know, it doesn't have any sharp edges, won't hurt you, um, but it does get you thinking on a different level, and that in itself is to build creativity. Um, and I wish I had a lot of examples, but I was scrambling to find the few things that I could point to here, and I really need to do a class, and I need to photograph what gets done in a class. But, so this could be condensed cursive, right? I mean. We could see that, or this could be, um, you know, what could this be? I didn't give myself a note. Um, it's, it's part of that hybrid script thing. Anyway, so, let's review. <laughs> um, well, before I say anything, do you want to say anything about what's been going on here so far? Any questions or any comments? Okay, this was a soft close here, you know. Uh, so, okay. So, I talked about contour, history, letterform modification, form, rhythm, movement. I know you didn't write this down, and it doesn't matter. It's sort of a tour of, like, well, what could be followed up on in the, uh, in the future. Um, I, ju the, the, I was after that exemplar thing because I feel it's treated as a, a, a destination rather than as the a scaffolding or as the beginning. And um, it doesn't say anything about what's happening on the page. And some of the things I tried to talk about tonight is about things that are happening on the page, the interaction of those letters. So it's been studied, interaction of color, 
uh, form and all that, but it, uh, somehow um, time has passed in the calligraphy world. So I will be teaching a black letter class this weekend, and lo and behold, I'm going to start with an exemplar. So just the, so war on the exemplar has not happened. Um, but if we also include the thematic elements and a little bit of visual syntax, you walk away with more tools than just being uh, handcuffed to an exemplar, um, especially the right exemplar, um, written, let's say, by a person who knows how to put those letters together. Um, so, it, and how do we know? We, put, we've we write a word like, like that in this black letter. Right? I didn't have it up there. And I don't think we can do in two days, but this is where I typically go with something. I'm designing a, I was designing a title, and I'm just showing you one of the, some of the places I would go. You may not like some of these, but that isn't really the point. The point is I want to, um, I'm looking for interesting combinations, potential animation points, not animation like in movies, but I want the living letter. I want to represent the spoken word in this ancient visual line and form. Can you see the strong vertical s structure, but on the, these two things, they're articulated differently? And arrange our arranging in space, obviously there's interaction going on with this close lock, lockup is what we call it in the design world. It's kind of like a puzzle. It has to be solved. Too many classes I'm in, calligraphers will just let those things collide. And, you know, I'm not like hating on that. What I'm saying is when I point it out, I'm in the position of saying, oh, no, that's wrong. Change that. And then they're going, how far? Left to the left? To the right? What do I do? And that's really not the point. I, I want them to start seeing and start learning how to self-critique. A bit of random waiting, a little cursive hybrid going on there. Um, on the right of this is subtle uh, cursive touches. I don't think people realize this is not a thing copied out of a book or something. Fracture is a theme. It's modular. And every time you do it, you can invent a little bit differently because there's really only two strokes here. I know that's, that's like a course unto itself, but that's really the truth. It's two modular strokes ex put in different instances. And that's, it's a game and it's something I took up for a long time. I just liked playing with that a lot. Uh, it turns out it was also a commission. Um, yeah, you know, we get paid for this. Um, so here the M is a little more radical. Uh, a little, but the structure is there, the same attitude of lines are there, so I'm still in the black letter theme. And you see how much movement and gesture we're trying to maintain unity. I'm kind of walking on the edge there a little bit. So here, gesture, ex God bless you, expressive line, movement on the page, and finally I'm breaking out of the grid again. And so it's kind of a funky thing going on there with that much movement. And again, it's always important that it hold together. So how far can I go off the edge and not break it? Are you, I'll <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, and finally, well, this is the same piece. I just wanted you to know that it was a real piece of calligraphy. And um, so, okay, I'll do the questions. That's it. You, we're done. Thank you. Thank you for coming and enduring that. I've been a, a huge admirer of yours for a long time, and I love the way that you mix two different styles of letter. And... Could you say something about how you make the choices and how you do the process that balances them? Yes, I, I'm happy to answer that. Well, I'm going to ask you a question, though. Did, did any of this seem like did address that very question? Right. Well, so that's you know. 
I could throw out some random ideas, but it really is that um, you can do trial and error. That's one. I think having a good retention or memory for things that you know have worked, but ultimately, it's really, to me, very uh, synthetic. It's like a painter. The, that whole bit about putting a line down and what do I do with that second line? That's the thing that usually we freeze up with or get tight or feel is a big decision. So sketchbooks, lots of trial and error. And um, of course, I'm always looking at things. But I'm careful to not, at least try not to be derivative. Um, I trust enough in my intuition and which I think is something that can be built like a muscle, you know. Um, I trust enough of that to get some nice, subtle surprises going on that I feel would be missed if I just was like mirroring something else that I saw. You know, we can look at the work of Rudo Spemann, beautiful black letter put together with light, beautiful italic. Now, if that's all the information you got and that you copy that, it's not a recipe for success. It, it doesn't mean yours is going to interact. Um, so having these visual tools, um, and, and the only way to get them is by doing, um, having those visual tools, I can evaluate. Too heavy, not heavy enough, lighter, bolder, thinner, narrower, and, that, and I hope that answered your question. All right, Nerola. Thank you, John. Um, I really liked the presentation. Actually, I really liked the section about line. Um, I have two questions. One is, what is your motivation? And second one, um, all this, how, how, how all this changed your perception or perspective on life? On life? We're going there, huh? <laughs> or maybe <laughs> on daily right, life. Right. I don't know. Well, on the life question, you got to do something with your time. Uh, <laughs> and um, so motivation, well, you know, that has to be renewed. Uh, and I ask myself that question all the time. So I, am, I was going for a, if you really wanted to look over my shoulder, uh, th these are the thoughts that I have and the, the way I look at it, um, truthfully. I think that the motivation is we love being creators. I think that's pretty much at the top of the list of things people like. I, I really like Julia Cameron's take on it, um, where people are motivated to be creators, but some are blocked creators. And uh, when you're a blocked creator, it doesn't mean that energy went away. It means you start using it in ways that are not the most effective. You know. Um, that's not any of you guys, because you show up to things and go to workshops and stuff like that. But a block creative is somebody who, you know, if I'm going to paint a room and they want to have a big argument about who's right about what color red it should be or whatever. Um, but so my motivation is really that I get to be, um, I get to create. I do like si solving design problems. Um, there, a lot of them are invisible design problems to the average person. I'm not creating a new subway system or things like the people. It's definitely more on the aesthetic, maybe even esoteric side. But I would say that's probably the excitement. And I love the craft that we're in. I showed a page that was a title page for that Carnegie thing. Uh, it was hard work, but there's a lot of joy in that, you know, to do that and to create that and make that thing. So I think making and creating, two top things. Yeah. OK. Getting my exercise here tonight. Hi. Um, thanks for sharing your work. It's so beautiful. I wanted to ask you about the um, improvisational work that you showed. And I'm curious if you arrive at the composition before you start the work or as you're doing the work in your head and how you get to the composition. And also, if you write the, when you're doing those, if you write the words in, in the order of the sentence, let's say, or if you jump back and forth to fill up the spaces or 
Like, what's the co internal conversation you have in your head as you're doing those? Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. Well, I am a calligrapher. I'm, uh, I'm trained as that. And so it is writing from left to right and s sort of keeping with that. Um, the, um, I don't know if you've had the experience of you go into your studio where you just take a brush or a pen, you make one mark, and you go, ooh, that's something. You know, have everybody ha who hasn't had that experience? So nobody. Um, how do you expand that? That's the, that's the thing, that's the, I'm calling it methodology or the craft. So no, those, uh, those experimental pieces are just that came to a blank piece of paper and um, made that mark or it started that thing and then went with that energy. And that's really, I didn't mention energy, but that's a lot of times what I'm thinking is staying in the energy. Um, it was funny, this weekend we were working, it was a very quiet class. Um, no noise, everybody was so quiet. And the only place I've seen quieter than that has been in Japan and uh, pin drop stuff. But normally, I've got some pretty loud music going on <laughs> when I'm working. And um, I like music a lot. And, um, you know, I'm not going to do the platitude of it, you know, it motivates me, but it just feels normal to me to have that going on like that. Um, so, Th those spontaneous, they're all quick, they're, 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 as they look like they're quick, and it's just catching a moment in time. I, I doubt if I could repeat one of those pages exactly, but it get, I, it's like a thread and you just start pulling on it, you know, and it feels like, it, as long as it still feels good, you keep doing it, and I like the image that I'm making, and I like making images, and I like making images out of letters, so, um, it, but it is, the, the challenge is having enough craft to stay in that thing. And you'll see, this, this, what I'm doing right now is just kind of like those movements, you know? And it is very much like music, because, you know, everybody knows what, bam, ba -dum, t -dum, t -dum, t -dum. okay, but you know rhythms come in layers and can have a lot more going on than that and never lose that, bam, ba -dum, you know? So it's like that. The rhythms are more complex and, um, and so that's a game for me, and that goes back to the motivation thing, too. It's kind of feeding your eyes, feeding your creativity. So when I go back and have to do some boring job, I don't mind so much. Okay. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for this presentation. Thank Your work you. is phenomenal and highly inspiring. Um, I wanted to ask you, as somebody who's personally interested in pursuing this kind of work, um, as a beginner and as somebody who's kind of self-teaching in addition to doing the Type West program, how do you meaningfully practice and effectively evaluate or self-evaluate your own work as you go through the process? Yeah, yeah that's a question that um, so effectively practice. Well, that's where I start sounding like an, uh, an old-fashioned calligrapher. I think you do have to study the classics. Um, I think you have to, I don't know what stage of beginner you're referring to, but um, I made a reference to historical manuscripts because when you're just getting somebody's exemplar off of Pinterest, you don't know what you got. You know, could be good, could be crap. Um, and so you start practicing, let's assume that you got a bad one, and you start practicing that, even if you're diligent, you're teaching your muscles and your eyes wrong things. We can trust the historical manuscripts because they were real objects, real things, and some are better than others. And you, you get exposure, you know, and we learn by osmosis. Um, so there's that. There are a few good books out there. Um, if you, I'll tell you afterwards if you want some references. Uh, but it's, I think, studying the classics and some of this stuff I was talking out there is way out there at Pluto, you know. Um, and m it, just getting the good form knowledge and craft of making good letters um, will take you far. As far as methodology, how much time do you got? Um, again, I, 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 I tweeted this once. I said, you know, this calligraphy doesn't get any easier. You know, I've been doing it, I guess, just about four decades or so, and it's still difficult. It's still a challenge. It's a, a good challenge, but it's a challenge. Um, 
So another thing I don't know about you is desire. You know, that has a lot to do with it. That's worth more than probably anything. So um, did I answer both parts? Set my Okay, we got maybe one or two more questions. Students, got a question brewing? Okay, Kathleen. Oh, hi. Um, I could be very wrong, but you have a great book called Scribe, which I have one of. It seems to be out of print. Is there any chance, it seems to be an important book that is out of print, any chance of it coming back in? I didn't know that. Um, it's out of print. How, how do you know that? Because it cost a lot and I couldn't find it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, I, you know, nobody's told me that, so I have to go look into that to answer that. Um, I would be, it is at John Neal. Um, so that's, that, he's the publisher of the book, so uh, John Neal Books. Um, I'd be, I'd be surprised if he didn't tell me because we would probably have a conversation like, what would we have to do to reprint it, you know? And my problem is I have to dig out Quark Express. <laughs> anyway, um, but. <laughs> okay, anything else? Okay. It's just such a pleasure to be here and see your work, and I. I and to see you, and I love your work, um, so inspiring. My question is what you, your thoughts on calligraphy and art and where those two meet. Um, the place of calligraphy and art, and I think I heard or read at some point you were thinking of that uh, an actual museum of calligraphy should be created to put calligraphy in its proper place in the art world? Yeah, I have thoughts about that. But um, the thing is, is that uh, I'm not fond of the word calligraphy. I don't think we can get there from here with that word. So that, a, a rant of mine five, six years ago was that the only way we're going to do it is get rid of that word and put everything under the umbrella of letter arts. I think that started to happen. We have that letter. Uh, letter arts archive and type west and things but more can be done in terms of um, I think there's a lot of enthusiasm and interest in letter forms and it's still a mystery nobody knows really why uh, you know We're, in Johnston's era it being a useful thing was one of their goals I mean if a, if a letter form could be read that made it a useful utilitarian thing and that was important we're not there anymore. It's just not on the radar. And I've devoted a good part of my life to this, and I still don't fully understand other than what I said earlier about creating. So I think of letters as a medium, but also kind of the end point. You know, we're just attracted to letters. They're graphical symbols. They're ancient. They've got power unto themselves. If you're referring to why art museums haven't come around on this, that is a complicated question. Um, and I, it's only in the West. It's not that way, and you've probably heard that a thousand times already. Um, so why is that? I'll, let me. Do you have an idea? Well, think about the way calligraphy is taught. Um, so it, it, it's. There, I think it starts there. Or, well, the fact that we stopped teaching it too, but that that it's totally tied to writing and the action of writing. And that's part of why I'm pushing the visual side of it. Um, now, I'm not the only one doing that, uh, it, it, but just thinking of it as a utilitarian skill, something that's quaint. We used to do wedding invitations, all of that. Does the word bespoke attack, uh, you know, attach to this? But um, yeah, so how do, how, you, okay, you, you, got an, you just got a kind of an eyeball full of stuff that I'm thinking and put it out there, right? And I'm sure some of it seemed a little heavy, a little overwhelming. Um, so how do we deal with that? If, if, if I said, here, this is me writing, and this is italic, and here's some flourishes and stuff. Oh, actually, let me put it in Instagram speak. <laughs> um, so it, do, it doesn't progress 
the, the question, in my opinion. And again, because I've devoted a good part of my life, I care about the outcome here. And I, for 35 years, I haven't seen the ball move very far as it being given the place of honor I think it deserves. And everybody's got, the other thing is there's no agreement in our community on how this should be done. You know, lots of people, ideas. And what I learned in kind of business is that you got to kind of announce at the beginning of the meeting, this is, is, this is not an ideas contest. It's, it's, yes, you put things out there, but you don't want to get into a situation where you're um, trying to figure out, you know, the, the ego gets involved, who's got the best idea, if we can't do it this way, the hell with you, you know? kind of a thing. Um, but I'm not, sure, I'm not sure where this thing goes now that it's in the realm of social media because a lot of people are interested, a lot of people are doing it. And then the last part, I'm not sure it matters anymore. Uh, that's the last part of that, that if the Met or the MoMA doesn't ever buy a piece of Thomas Ingmeyer's calligraphy, that was why I was pushing the museum. Why don't we start our own? That was the idea behind that. Okay. Okay, so we have time for one more question. One more. All right. Um, hi. Uh, one museum that uh, does uh, showcase a lot of calligraphy is the Asian Art Museum right next door. So is it any, one museum it's museum. Asian? Well, both modern, both very modern and ancient. Right, but Asian, right? Japanese and Chinese? Right, okay, no, but, okay, but it's not Western calligraphy. I, in, in Japan, they have amazing exhibitions, calligraphies in museums. It's an accepted art form. Same in China, same in Korea. The, the, I think the question was to Western calligraphy. Why, why are we so behind on, on this one issue? And it's, you know, I love having that conversation. As I said, I care a great deal about what happens. Um, so I think where I've mellowed a little bit is I'm happy we have collections like the uh, San Francisco Library, the Letter Arts, uh, Letter Form Archive. Um, so I'll go, I'll go with, well, this is what we do have you know, um, and work from there. As long as there's interest and there's passion, I, you know, I just owned up to being a sign painter. I used to disown that stuff because it was, that was also misrepresented and misunderstood. I was supposed to be covered in paint, walking in with this big paint toolbox, and, um, you know, I didn't know anything about lettering. I'm just making, and making those deli signs, baloney, you know. And, um, and actually, they're kind of a thing, you know, uh, anyway, but, uh, so, uh, but, um, it, like anything, you, you, can do, you can do it as deeply or as surfacely, surfacely, that's not a word. My tongue is this thick right now. <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah, so I wish we could follow the lead. That would be a question back to you. Why is it recognized in you know, uh, Asian cultures and, and Middle East, it's in, integrated. I've never been to, um, you know, Middle Eastern countries, but from what I'm able to gather, it's in, on buildings all over the place, and it's a definite part of, um, you know, there's no translation needed that this is art and this is just, you know, utilitarian letters. They see the beauty of the script, is what I'm saying. And um, what, why do you think we lag behind? I, I, that's a question I have for everybody, uh, you know. So new people to this question will probably say, well, if I just get it in front of a curator or something, it'll be picked up. But there's people in this room that have done that or have been involved in that, and it didn't happen. Uh, there's somebody I know back in New York that got a meeting with one of the curators in um, the Met, and what he brought got, well, he was trying to get Herman Zoff's work. Everybody here know who Herman Zoff is? Okay. okay. Um, and it got relegated to the print room. But the same story happened to Milton Glaser with his posters, too. Um, so it's just about changing attitudes. We're certainly in a time where that, some of that is happening, and some places it's being resisted. So, you know, I think we'd rather create than take on a fight like that. So. 
Okay, thank you so much, John. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you for coming out, and thank you for being interested.